proceeding with our attendance. Um, Mike, you can lead the attendance. Wow, how cool being coach here today. Oh my God. All right, we'll start with um, Dan. So oh, Dan, um, I am here. Oh. Um, Re. All right, no, Re. Um, oh, Re's here. I'm here. Okay. Re's here. Oh, sorry. Oh, hello, Re. Hello, sorry. Um, Naomi. Naomi is Na here. Oh, my apologies. You're good. Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie's here. Um, Alan. Not here. Alan, not here. Chad. Chad's absent. Gabe's absent. James. Here. James is here. Um, Alex. Nope, nothing from Alex. Taylor. Here. And Paul. Paul is not here. All right. Okay. As we only have five people, we do not meet quorum to vote on anything today. But otherwise, we will still be having our speakers and updates, um, but we will not vote on anything. So now we will begin with the approval of the agenda. Is there anything anyone would like to add? Yes, Kenny? i uh, just like to give a quick update that we've been notified that Dr. Simpkins cannot make it today due to scheduling conflicts, so that will be not in the agenda. Okay, thank you, Kenny. Um, I want to um, make sure that we have the cross-functional task force under point J on the committee updates. Okay, are there any other changes that anyone would like to make? Seeing none, we will move on. All right, on to chair updates with me. Um, so just a reminder, I will be absent next week um, for Friday. There is a document in our SharePoint training section where I have written some proposed trainings for incoming counselors in May. I would really like um, y'all to add to this, give some feedback, some ideas, but your voice in there. This is basically a manual for the next year's councils, counselors and these trainings that I'm proposing. They're completely voluntarily and informal. Um, they will likely take place in our office. Um, yes, please just add to it. Thank you. Oh, and we have Spring Fling this next Wednesday, as well as Will is coming next Friday. I mean, Dr. Simpkins. Thank you. <laughs> On to SACAB with Mike. Hello, everybody. Um, in SACAB today, um, we are currently um, drafting a bill to address the lack of student representation, or I'm sorry, lack of voting participation um, of students on certain boards around this campus. So um, the ABOD board, which is the area board of directors, they currently have a student representative, but um, that representative cannot vote. Um, and also they're kicked out of executive session. I believe this is the same for the board of trustee as well. So um, we are currently crafting a bill that we want to pass around to each institution once it's been passed by SACAP and um, get you all support. And um, this might be a bigger issue that um, I might want to take with me um, into a, bit, a bigger kind of realm next next year. Um, secondly, for SACAP, um, spring fling. So I'm going to make sure all of um, each institution's table, so the CCD and UCD, um, I want to make sure we have SACAB swag and then um, SACAB is going to be posting out um, little surveys. So each institution is taking a survey. So CU Denver is taking um, safety on campus. MSU Denver is taking um, space for student orgs on campus and um, CCD is taking food options on campus. And we're going to do kind of craft a little uh, survey like it's a yes no survey. You kind of um, like you indicate with the yes or no on there. So um, that's all we did in SACAB, I believe. Stephanie, do you have anything to add? Stephanie. Thank you. OK, on to Board of Trustees, but Gabe is absent, so I'm sure he can give his update next week. So we will now do the Budget Committee with Mike. Hello, everybody. Um, budget Committee. So we met <clears throat> James and Gabe and I met, um, I believe this is this Tuesday. Um, we are looking at the budget, just kind of um, making ends meet. Um, one 
Um, question that did come up is um, pay for next year. So um, as um, a lot of people um, know in this council, um, it was voted upon that um, at the end of the year, um, whatever pay we or whatever budget we have left will be donated to the food pantry. Well, um, that makes kind of a, there's an issue there, um, meaning that um, there'd be a significant pay cut for counselors next year. So um, this is definitely something we're going to discuss. Um, is it was uh, the support for a pay cut was not there wasn't a lot of support for that. We want to see if we can keep it just the same for next year. Um, so that's something the budget committee will bring up, and then probably after elections, we will vote on next year's counselors' pay, um, at, as is tradition um, on this body. So um, I will have that after election. Um, next, let's do uh, sustainability committee with Taylor. Thank you, Mike. Um, the ASCP, they're very excited for Earth Week, which is next week. Ooh. Um, <laughs> personally, I will be tabling that Monday, doing a little pawning event. Um, and then um, on Friday, they are doing the river cleanup. And I highly encourage all of you to go participate in the river cleanup. Um, thank you all so much. That is my update on to the Judiciary Committee with James. Okay, I don't have a major update just because my committee members are out of state doing some amazing work. Um, however, I will run through a quick update that I personally have for the Judiciary Committee. I am currently working on like a full blown length accountability process since uh, obviously this year has been so hectic with trying to get through all that. So I will be drafting a whole actual version, introducing it to my committee next week for their approval. Once they've approved it, I will introduce it to you guys next Friday and we can discuss it. And after we have any feedback on it, I will then bring it to the deans and advisors for their feedback and approval on as well. And then we will vote on it to make this an actual accountability process. So that way next year, if we have any future issues with anything going on in TSAC, the next year's council doesn't have to worry about all the issues that we've been going through and it can just be more streamlined. Uh, that's pretty much it for the Judiciary Committee. Thank you, James. On to the TSEC PR Committee. Chad is out of town, so if any other members have an update. Going once, going twice, oh, going okay. thrice. Oh, James, do you? <laughs> no, we didn't meet, so no. Wonderful. So we are now going to the Policy Advisory Committee with Re. I have no report as we have not met. All right, thank you, Ree. Let's go to the Faculty Student Advisory Committee with Ree. Yes, um, so I got an email from Barbara and I asked Kenny if he'd print a couple of pages from her, what she asked of us. So two of the subcommittees that are working on um, Dr. Simpkins' Student Affairs Strategic Plan, they reached out to Barbara with um, the Faculty Senate to see if they could share what they've done so far on student engagement and housing insecurity. Um, no? What does that mean? Taylor, were you talking to me? No. Oh, okay. okay. I just saw something from the chat that said no. Okay. Um, and so what I had asked Kenny if he was able to print, and if not, I will email everyone, but the drafts of these plans, they are really asking for our comments and our feedback on this. So this student engagement team has asked for this, and, you know, for the, for us to give them comments about what they might have missed, things that we feel are important in regards to the housing insecurity draft and also increasing student engagement. So there are two separate, um, that's one of them, yeah, two separate uh, drafts, I guess you could say. The goal three is student affairs will create tailored experiences to increase student engagement. So they've written some metrics, they have what they think their vision is, and they are asking a bunch of questions here and considerations that they'd like us to feed back. And so if you'd like to get into, I'll forward this to all of you, so then you can make comments on, in the Word document. And the same with the housing insecurity one. So they are looking for objectives to strengthen um, housing and, and have more security for students. And this really goes along with a lot of things we've been working on this year. So I'm hoping you'll be energetic in your response, and um, then we can provide that to Barbara to give to the um, student affairs as they're working on this. That's all. All right, thank you so much, Ree. Um, <clears throat> we will now move on to the cross 
um, Disability Task Force, I believe. Oh, I thought that was another. Never mind. Um, we will go to the Indigenous Student Resource Committee with Naomi. Uh, yeah, so I uh, forgot that I actually had an update from a couple weeks ago. I did meet with uh, Cynthia and her team um, and Desiree Richards about getting the student engagement package that we had originally proposed for TSAC to fund for her department to fund now. And uh, we got uh, to take a look at the survey for Indigenous students and it looks great. So um, I'll probably have to schedule another meeting with Ms. Uh, Dr. Barone and see about when we can get that um, implemented and, you know, start getting engaged with students. Um, I did speak with one of the NISA leaders this past week. Um, they, I unfortunately could not make it to their meeting to discuss some stuff that we want to do resolutions on. Um, I had a family emergency. So um, yeah, hopefully we can get started on that by uh, next Thursday. Um, and since the other members of the committee are gone, I think that is all I have for updates. I do have what Paul put in the email if you want me to read it, his okay. update. Yeah, that'd be perfect. Thank you. Sorry, just stop. Sorry to step out of line because that was, that was on me. Uh, Mr. Chair, can I read this? Yes. Okay, from Paul Nelson on the Indigenous Student Resource Committee. Uh, this was his only update. He said, we still haven't met and it's really impeded the work of the committee as a group of student government members that are tasked with advocating with Native and Indigenous students. Uh, we need to meet to have functioning pursuit of our business. And that's all he said on the Indigenous Student Committee. And then he has something on cross functionality, which I will update when you guys are ready for that one. Thank you, committee. On to the um, cross functionality task force committee with James. Thanks. Uh, speaking again for Paul, uh, this is what Paul has said about this. He has said, we have a critical role in facilitating student voice for the faculty workload reduction information gathering process. I've set two tentative dates to hold listening sessions on the 18th from two to three and the 19th from 12 to one. I can't do this alone and I need your help and I need volunteers to facilitate these listening sessions. I need help securing a room in the Tivoli so we can hold this place in a place where students can participate. Please reply to his email, the email that I'm reading right now, if you can help during either of those times. I will need help of the PR committee to get the survey out, out as the committee has created and part partnership with the faculty members and admin on the cross functionality task force. Thank you, my colleagues. All the best, Paul Nelson. And that's all that Paul has updated us on. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, Mike, did you have something? Oh, no, I have to... OK, on to the open floor announcements slash updates. Yes, um, I have one for that, and it's to emphasize spring fling is Wednesday. Um, we need to make sure we have people at that tabling event. Um, this is a great way to get out swag. It's a great way to get out merch um, and really promote student government with uh, surveys and stuff. Right now, I believe I'm the only one that signed up for it um, for the whole event. I'd rather not work that whole event alone. I'd rather have some some, some help from other people as well. Um, so um, I I will but I'll probably do this send out a spreadsheet tonight um, by email and ask for some support um, out of our fellow counselors. I know we're all very busy, but um, we should definitely show up at this event. So. Wonderful. Are there any other announcements slash updates? James. Uh, it was mostly a question for Mike. Uh, when is spring fling and then where's the sign up sheet? I'm sorry, I've again with my leg, I've been really out of loop on things. That is totally fine, James. Um, I will send out the spreadsheet momentarily. Um, it takes place in the same place it does for Fall Fest. So um, we are going to be in the same place with all three institutions, SGAs and um, student life offices. Um, it's going to be from 10 to 2. So um, <clears throat> like it's an easy way to kind of fill in some hours. Um, so yeah. What day is it, Mike? It would be Wednesday, th uh, this next Wednesday. OK, thank you. Wonderful. Are there any other open floor announcements slash updates? Going once, going twice, and going thrice. We're going to be moving on now to our advisor updates. Hi, all. Um, is I don't think Armando's here today, right? I don't think so. OK, um, so uh, I apologize that I couldn't be there in person. I am at a family function right now, but I did want to um, call in and give you all some updates. 
Uh, Naomi talked a little bit about the survey um, for Native Indigenous students. We did um, share that survey for three students who identified as Native and Indigenous this week to, to take a look at it and to actually complete it and give us some feedback. So once we get their feedback, we'll be able to um, go ahead and disseminate that. Um, to get student participation. So hoping that that will happen, um, not hoping, shooting for this um, coming week. Um, and then um, also uh, providing the incentives that you all had recommended for folks to participate. And then we will be offering an additional opportunity for focus groups um, to be conducted this um, a little bit later on in the summer. Um, so that's what's going on uh, with Desiree and that, that work. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about is the inauguration event. Um, Taylor, uh, Armando and I met uh, yesterday and talked about what that could look like um, and looked at, uh, so you'll be getting more information about that soon, but just to mark your calendars, making sure you all have it for April 28th, it will be during our normal um, meeting time with those uh, newly elected office or council people, um, counselors. Um, and so just wanted to remind you all about that. Um, and then we're also looking at onboarding of those new council members, as well as thinking about uh, the conference. There's a conference this summer in June, um, specifically for student governments that we are hosting, not we, this um, CU Denver is actually hosting it. Um, it's the same conference as last year. Um, so hoping that that's an opportunity, uh, folks, if they're interested in, we'll need to get folks registered for that relatively soon. And so um, Armando will probably be sending out information about that as well for the continuing, um, the continuing council. And then the other thing we're looking at is um, onboarding um, in August and identifying some key dates. Um, we're looking at probably at least two to three days of like a leadership retreat because we think we really it, we really need more time than one day, um, especially with just bringing on new people. So we have a lot of um, good ideas around that and we'll share more as as we can. Um, the other thing is um, voting. Uh, we have more participation. I don't know where we're at right now exactly, but I do know that we've exceeded both of the past years um, with votes and getting student elections out and getting the vote out. So we're really happy about that and hoping that those numbers will continue to grow through the end of the day. Um, so great job to the elections team on that. Um, I think, yeah, I think th those are the main points I had. Um, yeah, and that's what I can remember. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Barone. Mike has a question. Yep. Yes, yeah, so I'm Barone. on my phone, so sorry, I can't see the chat. <laughs> oh, no, you're totally good. Um, so in terms of inauguration, inauguration is in April, but their term does not start until June, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, so, that is yeah. correct. Perfect. Just making sure. Thank you. Yep. Wonderful. Um, on to our elections updates. Is Chad here or is Jody here? Oh, James, uh, sorry. James has his hand up, I think. Yeah, sorry. James, go ahead. I was mostly just notifying the council that I would have to, uh, and I've known this for a while, I've just been meaning to write it. I would have to amend our constitution because the way I wrote it back in the day was inauguration would be the end of our term. So I will I will write an amendment to that. So just so everyone's aware how it's currently written, but I will get it fixed. Thank okay. you. Thank you, James. Would love to work on you with that. Um, okay, so continuing to the elections update, is Chad C or Jody here? Okay. Yeah, Kenny. Okay. All right. Um, well, I'm not on the elections team. I am. Uh, I have helped assist uh, assisted them on that before, so I have some info. Um, generally, uh, voting ends tonight at midnight, and currently we are at around 280-ish votes, hoping to 300, 350 by the end of the day. So yeah, that's so far. Um, results will be processed and should come out sometime next week. All right, thank you. 
Um, so now we have nothing for 10 minutes. <laughs> um, so this can just be a free forum where we, we're just going to take a break for 10 minutes till public comment. OK, see you all at three o'clock. OK.
Okay, welcome back, everyone. We are now going into public comments. So if you are a member of the public, please make yourself known by raising your hand. We have Tristan. And Tristan, you can have two minutes. Oh, five minutes, my bad. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tristan Smith. I uh, he, him pronouns. I'm a senior at MSU Denver, um, history major, Africana studies minor. And I was uh, running in this uh, TSAC election this uh, previous week. And I sent out an email to all uh, current and potential TSAC members that included um, Dr. Simpkins, uh, Armando Arijo, uh, Cynthia Barone, uh, Than, um, Taylor Tackett, several other people uh, for full transparency and just to give a little rundown of everything that's been going on. So on Monday, whenever elections opened, I learned that my name had been placed under trustee rather than counselor. And uh, upon learning that, because I was planning to run as counselor, as I believe that was the only position I was qualified for with TSAC, uh, due to the uh, time remaining as a student at MSU, I reached out for verification as to which box I checked in my application with uh, the Student Elections Committee, uh, Chad Kavnis and Jody, and then as well as Armando and Cynthia and Pham were all tagged in that or copied into that email. And um, during that process, I found out that I had, in fact, checked the wrong box for trustee. But upon learning that, I um, also, I don't think this mic is working. Oh, there we go. I also, um, I also had questions about the verification process because uh, under trustee and SACAB, it says that as a student, you have to have one year remaining, but under the counselor position, it says that you need to be enrolled in one course, um, one credit course term or class per term served, which leaves a little bit of a question as to do you need a full year as a counselor? Just the verbiage was off for me. So I began to question the, the verification process with Armando, with Cynthia, with Anne, and with the elections committee to understand better a little bit about what they did to verify applications before the campaign started for, for students in order to protect the uh, the integrity of the student government and, and the TSAC Council. Um, during that time, I was given some answers, but then I, I requested some things. Some of the things that I requested included the timestamps of when my application was verified, as well as the uh, virtual identification of the person who verified my stuff. So when I went to turn in my application last Thursday, um, it was myself, uh, X, who I'm um, Antoine Johnson, um, and then another candidate whose name is Nathaniel Jones. And when we got there, we were told that Armando was not on campus and that Pham was in a meeting. So I had questions about the application, but another person, uh, Jermaine Gunnels, led us to Chad Kavnis and Jody in order to turn those applications in and ensure that we had everything complete. So they verified that everything was complete in the application, but then there was no further conversation about what other verification was going to take place. Um, but Armando wasn't there. Uh, we weren't able to talk with them because of the meeting, as I mentioned. So then everything just went through. I'm, I was labeled as a trustee. My question was, how could I be how could I be put under trustee category if I didn't meet the qualifications as I graduate in December of 2023? So I had questions about the process and then I, I began to ask those. And as I asked those, they weren't being fully answered. Um, and because I had checked the wrong box, I took full accountability for that, and I still take full accountability for that. That was that was my mistake. I should have ensured that that was that that was done. However, I also believe that there's some accountability that needs to be held by the student elections committee as well as the advisors because of the verification process and and the not not the the transparency that's not there. So I requested documents pertaining to the guidelines and the standards of the verification process and what all goes into that so I could better understand that process in order to better advocate for students. I accept that because of my position, because of my graduation in December of 2023, I will not be eligible to campaign. I'm not asking for a seat on the council or to be added back into this election as we already mentioned elections in tonight. Um, but I'm looking for accountability. And, and the reason for that is because I took accountability for my mistake. And I believe that as advocates for the students, we as individuals have to take accountability and then there has to be accountability at, at higher levels as well, right? And in order for, for any reformation or restoration to take place, there also must be healing. 
So in this process, uh, Cynthia, Armando, and Taylor uh, have all reached out to me and they've been willing to meet in person in order to go over some of the verification process guidelines. And I'm more than happy to do that, but I believe that accountability has to take place first. Um, so I also have not gotten the things that I requested as far as uh, the timestamps of when the application was verified or the virtual identification of who did. I'm sorry, uh, Tristan, but your five minutes is up. Is there somebody else who's going to do a public comment? There is. OK. Thank you, Tristan. We now have X for public comment. You have five minutes. X. Thank you. I would like to yield um, two minutes of my public comment for Tristan to finish his thoughts. And the remaining three I will yield. OK, two more minutes for Tristan. Thank you, X. So um, I sent out this email to have complete transparency with everybody on TSAC, to have complete transparency with the entire university and to fight for our students. Because with me being accepted without full verification of when my graduation day was, it could lead to flaws in or unfair elections, honestly, because ineligible students can run for TSAC. If I had ran as a counselor and not checked the trustee box, I could have been elected. And if I graduated in December, that could have led to my seat being vacated and then nobody to replace me, which could have destabilized part of the student government or led to problems within the student government. Um, and that's why I'm here is not only seeking accountability for for what happened in my situation because I accepted. I know that I made a mistake on my on my application. I'm looking for further accountability from higher up for mistakes that were made in the verification process, but also to help improve that so that we can advocate for our current and future students who want to participate in these types of events that transpire on campus. Um, I do believe that some important things to point out whenever it came to the email that I sent out to everybody. I did get two responses. Um, one was from Chad and uh, it, I don't know Chad personally. I don't know his character. So uh, speaking to the entire council, I believe that his, his response was TLDR. Uh, too long, didn't read. And for me, when a student is looking for advocacy, that's not advocacy. And we need to do all of us, even the students who I, I, I plan on advocating for all students, regardless of being a part of this council or not, uh, is, is to listen to when students are, are bringing up issues that exist in order to, to fix those issues and move forward, right? But also uh, John Nelson, who is a potential TSAC uh, candidate in this election, he reached out to me. He uh, did say, you know, I don't know who you are, but I got this email from you and I really want to learn more about you. And I felt that was a great way to start advocating for students. That's incredible to me. I want to get to know as many people as I can because it's so important to advocate for our students, right? Right outside this building, it says change makers wanted. If we want change makers, we have to advocate for one another, but we also have to have accountability from ourselves and from higher up. So that's why I'm here today. I wanted to make that transparent. I wanted to speak publicly on it so that everybody has a clear understanding of what's going on. I do, like I said, that email went to every TSAC member, every potential TSAC member. Please read through it when you get a chance. And uh, I'd love to continue fighting for accountability, fighting for our, our current and future students to ensure that the participation is still there. Thank you, Tristan. Thank you. Um, X, did you want the rest of your public comment? Yes, can everyone hear me OK? Yes. Awesome. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so part of the reason why I wanted to come in and speak to you all is just I wanted to echo the sentiments of Tristan when it comes to the whole synopsis regarding his verification. I was there. Um, Tristan, as well as Nathaniel Jones, were two students who I have talked to you about the Student Advocacy Council because they were interested in it before and they had also expressed interest in various formats um, depending on who they were talking to and why they wanted to participate within this council. As one of the founding members of the Student Advocacy Council, I just want to go off top and say that if council members are not representing all of the students, and just representing a portion of a student, you are not fulfilling your duties and obligations. But more importantly, when we have elections managers, when we have elections advisors, and to my knowledge, I may be wrong, but Armando, you are the elections advisor. For a student to be cleared and approved to run and enough due diligence around the investigation on whether or not he is qualified 
Um, to me, it's problematic and it sets students up for failure, but it can cause experiences what we don't want to have happen, where it seems like TSAC is becoming very exclusionary. And more importantly, when we changed it from the Student Government Assembly to the Student Advocacy Council, the intent behind that was to give students the opportunity to lead. If we're cutting students out just because they have a semester or a year, not every student learns that there is even a council where they can participate in leadership until the near end of their time here on MSU Denver. So it's problematic. But more importantly, if there is not accountability from our advisors, Dr. Cynthia Barone, Armando, to my knowledge, reports to you, as well as to Tan, depending on the structure of his job description, it's a problem. And the fact that some of these positions, administrators and student staff are being paid out of student fees, and we're having problems like this, which to me is a reoccurring theme when it comes to the student government assembly, which is people don't want to own their shit. And that's a problem for me. And that's a problem for students like Tristan, who have demonstrated that they can make an impact. So I would like to see some type of accountability from this student advocacy council, the elected people and those who are coming in to changing this election process and to ensure moving forward that we have an election manager and an election advisor who are doing their due diligence. Thank you. Thank you, X. Um, is there anyone else who has public comment? We have four minutes remaining. Going once, going twice, going thrice. All right, public comment is now, we're going to move on from it, but if anyone comes in the next four minutes, we will give them back to the floor. All right, on to Abby Kale with housing. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me today. My name is Abby Kell. I am the Student Housing Project Coordinator. I have been here before to talk about housing, and I'm back again to talk about housing. Um, I know, so exciting. Um, specifically today, what I'm going to be talking about is the strategic plan um, for student affairs around housing and security. Um, so I am leading that effort for MSU Denver, um, as long as some consultants from various departments throughout the university, Jeff Cox, John Holtzen, Ebony Nash, um, and Aaron Yulich. Um, and our huddle sponsor is Dr. Long. Um, so yeah, so if we'll go to the first slide. Um, the first slide that we're going to go over today is just basically the metrics for what uh, our housing and security is going to be evaluated on over the next few years through 2030. So if you'll go to the next slide, um, we have four metrics really to go off of when we were making this strategic plan, uh, not four, three metrics to go off of, two we already have, and one we will be collecting as we go through it. Um, so our metrics, uh, we don't have a lot of metrics for housing and security for campus, which we need to acknowledge as that is a barrier. And that is something the university needs to do better, and we've made plans to do better in the strategic plan. Um, but our main survey, or our main data point that we have to evaluate if this strategic plan is successful will come from our real college survey. Um, the last one that was done was done in 2021. It was basic needs and security during the ongoing pandemic. Um, and from that survey, we found about 51% of students who completed the survey were experiencing some type of housing insecurity. Full disclosure, only 9% of the students actually completed that survey. I would say from my experience working in housing that that number is probably significantly higher. Um, our next metric to evaluate um, will also be care center referrals around housing insecurity um, and the amount of care center referrals we've re received over the past three years. Um, in addition, um, a metric to collect as we do this will be our one we can piece together is our emergency fund reduction. As you know, the care center has emergency funds. Um, and one of our goals to hope measure is if the prevention strategies that we do work will decrease the amount of emergency funds used around housing insecurity. 
So next slide. So for this, um, we have five specific visions that we are going to be targeting um, in our strategic plan that I'm very excited to get rolling out. Um, and these will be based off one to eight year different measures of when they will be completed. Our first one will be strengthening the K-12 to higher education transition. Next one will be prevention. Then exploring institutional and public policy to amplify resources and reduce barriers to student success data-driven improvements, and then explore innovative temporary supports and long-term solutions. So expanding on the strengthening to K-12 to higher education transition, these are some of the strategies we'll be doing. So this is what we'll be doing in this vision to help strengthen the pieces. And this is really to just start to prepare students before they come onto MSU Denver's campus for what they need to know about housing and the cost of housing. Um, some of the strategies will also need to be broken down into tactics because if, as you can see, as we read them, they're pretty broad, um, but uh, they do give us a specific way of how we're going to be doing it. Um, so some examples of these would be developing relationships uh, with the school districts, McKinney-Vento liaisons. If y'all aren't familiar what a McKinney-Vento liaison is, I can chat with you what that is afterwards. Um, Integrate housing supports for recruitment and admission. That's really making sure that recruitment and admission have all the tools they need to recruit and admit students about housing. Um, our next one would be investigate opportunities uh, to implement flexibility within cost of attendance. Um, this really is going to be how can we utilize the changes coming in financial aid to improve the amount of returns students can get on their refunds. Um, there's some changes coming to financial aid down the pipeline within the next few years, meaning that's going to increase the amount of Pell Grants. And so we've got to make sure that we're on the staying on top of those so that the students can get as much refund as possible um, and making sure that it's used towards housing, which will be done usually in the form of a refund. Um, this next one will also be around, uh, this next strategy will be around grants and scholarships. Um, we've kind of seen within the past few years that some of our grant and grants and scholarships are actually really not helping support our students around housing, but it's really actually kind of driving them a little bit into the hole. I'm speaking specifically to the Roadrunner Promise and actually the Native and Indigenous Grant Scholarship. And so we really want to look at those to make sure that it's really being equitably used and the students are getting the most amount of refund for what they can, <laughs> so they can use those housing, so they can use those refunds for things that they need. Uh, creating a robust and uh, creating a robust uh, housing referral process and navigation, improving that, um, as well as renovating the housing website. Um, so those are our K-12 to higher education. Our next vision is prevention. So this will be when the students are already on campus and they're going through housing insecurity, starting off with faculty and staff, really just improving their understanding around housing insecurity, also making sure that they know all the student supports, um, really also just trying to make sure they can have some tools in their tool belt to help students um, before we have to refer them down. Um, we have an eviction re assistance referral as well going on in the care center that is giving a lot of students support. Um, this is basically pro bono legal support to students who are going through any type of eviction. Um, learning opportunities. I've already discussed this with y'all, but um, this is also part of our planning. So like home ownership classes, renter's rights, um, pieces like that to give the students tools to know what to know their rights in it. Um, increased partnerships and preferred partners. This is going to look like more apartments than just like the villas, collab and the assembly. Um, and also, hopefully, I want to increase the funds in the care center. Our next vision is going to be explore institutional and public policy to amplify resources and reduce barriers. This is just another way of saying that I want to prioritize grant research or grant investment, making sure that there, we're looking into homeless prevention strategies from the state. Um, there's money out there for us, and we just really need to prioritize for it. But also in that, we really need to create a unified message about what housing insecurity and homeless is specific to the MSU Denver student and really just I think across like Department of Education as well. Um, students who are experiencing homelessness and housing insecurity are very unique. They're not the same as other folks who are experiencing homelessness. Um, and typically the resources we refer to them are, need, are, are needed for a much higher need than the students. So it's really not supporting them. Um, also finding shared strategies throughout the community. Who else is doing this work? Who else can we connect with? Who else can we partner with? Um, and also really just develop more creative strategies for funding um, for our students. And then our next one, 
data-driven improvements. This is where we're going to amp up our opportunities to collect data. Um, but first, we really need to start with what is housing insecurity to MSU Denver? There's a stigma around it. A lot of people probably don't declare themselves as housing insecure or homeless. Um, so we're really going to try to revamp that wording around it um, so that we can collect more accurate data. Um, also developing a cross-functional team. Um, basically, this will be multiple different people from across the university that you can troubleshoot issues with, kind of like a care center for housing insecurity. You could kind of phrase it like that. Um, and then also requesting a reoccurring, a reoccurring survey um, biannually to collect data. And then our last strategy is going to be explore temporary supports and long-term solutions. Um, so this will look like possibly trying to, and we'll see which one of these down the pipeline is going to fit for us. And I'm also hoping for feedback on this, uh, but explore partnerships, maybe with tiny homes, developing a rapid rehousing program, um, exploring master tenant leases with different apartment complexes, and then also considering a safe parking option for our students. And that is my strategic plan for housing insecurity. And I am open to feedback. I'm open to questions. I am open to it all. All right. Thank you so much. Um, Naomi has a question. I have a question and a statement. Um, I would, the statement is, I just wanted to really say thank you for the acknowledgement that you and your team have um, just put out here that sometimes the grants that we offer for students slash scholarships, especially the Indigenous Peoples Grant, are actually more um, they're, they're not really helpful when it comes to the, um, you know, just having to work to live situation and while also having to go to school and afford um, the things that we need that are necessary to live. So I really appreciate that acknowledgement it is something that has been bothering the community since the release of the Indigenous Peoples Grant. So we really just um, thank you. Greatly appreciate that, at least on my behalf. I can't speak for the whole community, but we do appreciate you acknowledging that. Um, and then as for my question, so when it comes to doing, is this is this going to create more jobs for the institution specifically around um, grant researchers? Um, I'm not really sure I'm following your question. Um, are you talking about creating jobs for students? Or are you creating or making more for more full time jobs from like the hopeful grants that we'll get in the future? Is that what I'm hearing? No. So like because um, you, you uh, I don't remember which slide it was in, but um, you were saying that you guys want to do more research on the grants that are available. Um, mm, I think this, yeah. Um, so that way we can, no, I don't remember which one it was. Yeah, that one, there you go. Um, so where it says prioritizing grant, prioritizing grant research for housing specific opportunities. So like, obviously you guys have like a whole team, but like, are you going to dedicate someone specifically to this? Like, is that going to create a new job within the institution, whether that be part-time, full-time, that kind of situation. Gotcha. Thank you for clarifying that. So it's just me. Uh, I'm the only one doing housing for the campus. Uh, well, I'm the only. This is I'm the only one doing it on a full time basis. A lot of different people have a lot of different hands in the pot for this, um, as I'm sure y'all can imagine. Um, and so this is definitely something I'm going to be prioritizing because. We can't talk about housing insecurity without talking about money. Those two things go hand in hand. And when I'm thinking about supporting our housing insecurity students, I want to make sure we want to have we have as much in-house resources we can give to our students. I.e., I want to be able to give them as much rental assistance as we can possible. And so that's when I mean prioritizing that grant resources. The state specifically has money coming down the pipeline for prevention of homelessness services, and we are starting to qualify for those. And so that's what I mean, like prioritizing those and keeping staying ahead of the trends. Um, for example, like Division of Housing is, an, a, a, is a, a state authority that issues out grants to different agencies that are already doing homeless prevention work. So if we can establish we are already doing the work, we can request and possibly receive those funds. Yeah. Sorry if anyone had a question, I have clarification. So um, slash question, I guess. Um, so since this is like just on you, that's that's a lot of work. Um, and I feel yep. like, <laughs> oh, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so like and then, you know, we're having the crisis right now with our is it faculty over workload kind of situation. Um, how what what's the timeline feasibility with you being able to figure this all out on your own and would it be worth us advocating for you to potentially have like an assistant to help you with the workload 
I would say yes. I would love a different. I would love to include other folks on my team to expand on this, and so I would love that advocacy work. But I also do see this strategic plan broken down in different year increments, if that makes sense. So, like uh, the K twelve to the K twelve area and prevention, and even some of the public policy, we can do in one to two years, as well as I can also. I've already started the work on a lot of these tasks right here. I'm already exploring safe parking. I'm hoping we can have it be a possibility within the next one to two years. The Denver Housing Partnership has already been something that's going on. So just to also be honest, a lot of these things are already in motion um, and already that I've been doing. But I do see capacity being an issue as I look at the strategic plan because I am well aware that 95% of these tasks will fall upon me. <laughs> so yes, I would appreciate any advocacy. We are also doing at, at our level too as well. Taylor Tackett is doing a great job advocating for that as well. Um, and so there is word that we want to get it. We're just going to make sure it's within our ability. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, thank you, Naomi. I'm going to read Ree's comment and Mike has some questions. Ree says that was tremendous. So hopeful for this policy and its outcomes. Wonderful. On to Mike. Hello. Um, so um, this is really well done, like, like in terms of like um, a plan that has like some some accountability and some structure to it. I absolutely love this. So amazing job. Um, what is the next steps for this? Um, what, are, what is like what is your next steps for this moving on? Here? No, yeah, um, I appreciate all. I appreciate. I appreciate the compliment and I'm really I'm here for critical feedback like please like anything you see or have questions with expand on. I really just also want to give a huge shout out to the team that did this together. Ebony Nash, Aaron Olch, Don, Jeff Fox, all of these people really contributed to these things that I didn't know that our university was missing in this. So really also um, if you'd like I can give you their emails and you can also give them a shout out as well. Um, oh crumb. What was your second part of your question? Oh it was um what is the next steps? So my next step is I do have to go to all the other shared governments um, to offer, also receive feedback. Um, I think it was re on here mentioned from the like the dean councils. I need to get it from them. I need to get it from advancement, um, faculty faculty senate as well. So I have to go through that process. Uh, I believe also Dr. Simpkins will make his rounds as well um, with some of the strategic plans. So you might already you might hear this again from Dr. Simpkins. Um, and then our final drafts are due June first, and then they will be presented to the board. I believe in September. So just adding on to that then, um, so once you would, um, and I can't say we can't, can't do this today, um, one thing I can say is we can send this out to you, the rest of the membership because um, we're missing a few counselors today, but um, would you say like an endorsement between governments um, after we've looked it over, given you some feedback, do you think that helped make the process a little more smoother? I would love that. Um, absolutely. And I would love, I know this meeting is a little, a little bit smaller today, so please send it out to everyone and all critical feedback one-on-one. -on -one, via email, however it's preferred. I also want to acknowledge, I know workload is probably a lot for y'all right now. It's the end of the semester um, and there's a lot of things and y'all are also being approached with a lot of things right now. So I want to be mindful of that. So please continually go for it. Um, I won't need a final draft until June. So I'm also happy to come back um, to discuss it again if needed. Thank you. I want to touch on a couple things. I'm a little bit ignorant to housing. So I just have, want to know about how these things might relate. Um, so one thing that I want to know about is public housing, then also social housing. And then I also want to know, um, I know in the mayor's race, Mike Johnson, he talked about the um, tiny homes and there was a lot of criticism with that, like people saying it, they would, it would be like a communal kitchen, a communal bathroom, and just not a good situation. But I don't know. I, like I said, I'm ignorant. I want to know how these things relate and what you think. So would you like me to give you the definitions of those different types of housing or my thoughts on just some of those policies? <laughs> um, like if this would interact like with public housing, um, kind of what social housing is, yes. So just like kind of like a little bit of breakdown on how how housing goes. Um, so we don't use the term Section 8. We don't use the term public housing anymore. It's normally used in the term of like rental assistance um, or you might hear, hear HCVs or PBVs. Those sound for housing choice and public uh, or project-based units. Um, so typically full-time students don't qualify for rental assistance or like formerly public housing or Section 8. Um, and that's because financial aid is usually the barrier is that y'all qualify for financial aid. So you qualify for that form of assistance, even though typically it can be in the, more than likely it's in the form of loans. So you don't qualify for it. There are like caveats for it that I have understood and worked through since my time of joining here and then also working in rental assistance. 
um, that I can help students with. So like part of my goals would be to also train other people in that so that if a student's like, I don't know if I qualify for this, then multiple people can know if they do or don't qualify for it. And so like that's kind of the aims. As for like some of the like solutions that like the mayor office is, solution is, is going for, I really think we can also utilize that in our favor because the big thing what the mayor's office is going to be able to do is they're going to give money to agencies to be able to do that. Um, whether or not we qualify for those, that's left yet to be determined. Um, we have one more minute. If there are any other questions, comments, going once, going twice, and thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate all of the work that you're doing on this. This is a huge goal of us, and I really hope that you can come back um, next year too to help the new council make this a priority for them too. Thank you, Abby. Um, Kenny, can you send the presentation to the rest of the council? Thank you. Um, and now we're going on to our ne next speaker, which is the amazing David Fine. David, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm here to talk to you guys about the bookstore closing. You may have heard that the Barnes & Noble brick and mortar bookstore will be closing. We're still working with them on the on the deadline or the date. It's likely going to be closing sometime next fall um, so that in the fall it looks like things aren't going to change the, the change will be next spring um, and so we want to just brief you on the issues and just so you know what's going on there should be um, a survey going out soon if it hasn't already gone out both the students and the faculty not so much asking them you know so what do you want do you want a brick and mortar do you want uh, online but really asking about your preferences and your behavior. How do you right now get your books? How do you um, how do you use the existing bookstore, et cetera, et cetera? Because what we're trying to figure out is um, whether to keep a brick and mortar bookstore and whether to keep it with Barnes and Noble or somebody else, if not whether to have a virtual bookstore and who to do that with. Barnes and Noble has wanted a, wants us in order for them to keep running the bookstore. And this is all based on the, fact that they're losing tons of revenue and it's mainly because of the uh, use of oer online educational resources and also students are finding other ways to get their books whether it's through amazon or, or other means that you guys probably know more about than i do um, <clears throat> so they're losing money and they they want to get out of the contract which they're entitled to do so um they say they'll stay in the in the contract in the brick and mortar bookstore if they if we sign up to what they call their first day complete program, which is a program they call an equi equitable access program. Really what it is is a program that's designed to get students to buy all of their books right up front at the beginning of the year for all of their classes at a, at a particular rate. May or may not be, um, depends on what how much students pay on average, which we don't know for sure for their books. Otherwise, it may be less maybe more, but that's sort of their, they call it equitable access. Really, it's a way for them to get their revenue up front to guarantee that they'll get revenue up front through the students buying their books. So um, that's the way, that's the only way they'll, they'll probably agree to keep the bookstore open. Other uh, vendors, like there's a, there's a company called Follett, has a program like that, but it's completely voluntary as opposed to it, it, what Barnes & Noble wants is, is students basically have to opt out so you're in until you opt out. Um, to this program, so that's one of the th one of the considerations. So we just want to let you all know, you, the students know, and we've also let the faculty know, sort of about what these issues are. And a decision will be made, likely probably by the fall. We're trying to get survey results back. We're talking with a so you guys understand how this campus works. Right, AHEC right now. In the past, they ran the bookstore themselves, then they got out of that business and they contracted with Barnes and Noble to run the bookstore. So there's a contract between Barnes and Noble and AHEC. AHEC is a shared services provider for this entire campus with for the three universities, which is us, CU Denver and CCD. And so mostly CU Denver and MSU use the bookstore. CCD students don't don't so much. They're not super interested in, in, in this issue, honestly. Uh, I don't think it's going to change things a lot for them. So the, one of the questions is, is, does AHEC negotiate a new deal with Barnes and Noble? They probably would for a brick and mortar bookstore, but if we go online, it might just be us negotiating directly with the online provider. There's a whole bunch of companies that do online 
services and CU Denver would likely do their own contract. We likely wouldn't go through AHEC. There's, and we get some money from these contracts. And right now the money goes to AHEC not for commissions that the bookstore pays for every sale. We'd get some commissions if we go to an online model depending on the on the contract. So, which is not as relevant to you as students, except for the fact that some of that money can be used to support the operations of the school. Um, but we don't know the numbers yet because we haven't seen contracts for them. So uh, I'm here to answer any questions that you, you all might try to answer questions you all might have about this because I there's a lot I don't know. Um, and you may have questions that we haven't thought of. So I, I just want to give you a report and uh, sort of get your thoughts. And you can always uh, email me your thoughts or call me up or whatever later if something occurs to you down the road. But I'm the lead for us on this issue, negotiating with AHEC, CU Denver, and, and, the, and the bookstores. Yes. Um, we have our stack. We will do re then Mike for questions. Are you ready for questions? Sure. Okay. Re, um, Mike, then James. Hi. Um, you know, David, I'm thinking about how hard we are trying to, as a university and as TSAC, we've just had a presentation on OER and to help our students be able to afford, you know, books and not having to pay so much for them. It doesn't seem to make sense to continue to support a book, books, a brick and mortar store to me. What do you think? So it's a great question. I mean, we, we have heard a lot about the cost of books, the very high cost of books. OER is fantastic for students. It's a movement that's this is happening all across the country. It's not just here. It's great for our students. Um, we have there's a state program as well that um, gives us a little bit of money to increase our OER offerings that potentially could be threatened by a first day complete program. So that's you know, that's a, that's a great question. I think ultimately OER is going to continue here, whether we have an online bookstore, whether we have a brick and mortar bookstore, whether we have a contract with Barnes and Noble or somebody else. So that movement's going to continue and that will continue to benefit the students regardless of what we do with the bookstore. But it will affect probably you know, whether we have a contract with the bookstore and who it is because it's cutting into their sales in a big way and could be that bookstores are sort of becoming a thing of the past. Um, you know, I've also heard of students not just doing OER, but they find ways to get their books that are easier, more efficient, more effective than going through the bookstore. And so I assume students will continue to do that. There's nothing we're going to do, no matter what contract we sign, that's going to prohibit students from, you know, finding, using their own, finding their own alternative ways to buy books or rent books. The, right. the, F, the FDC program, First Day Complete program, is not a generally a purchase program. It's a kind of a rental program for a so sort of like a subscription program. You get your books use them for the semester, you bring them back. And and if we, and so that's that's their way to try to deal with this issue. If we go to a virtual model, we'll also have likely have a place probably at the Tivoli to pick up the books and, and bring them back. So that's likely gonna, that's something we, we're gonna have to get in place, although AHEC, it hasn't quite figured that out. And then the other issue that I haven't mentioned is the space where the bookstore is will has to be reutilized. Likely what AHEC wants to do is to, I put some kind of convenience sort of store in there on the top floor, maybe some other kind of mm -hmm. use on the, in the basement. And we welcome your thoughts on that and or additional food options down there. So those are the, yeah. Wonderful. On to Mike, James, Taylor, then Naomi. All right. Um, thank you, um, Mr. Pine. Um, so just a few things. Um, because it's most recently in my mind, um, I am on say cab, I'm the chair of say cab. Um, and this uh, has been like a rumor that's been floating around for quite a minute now. Um, and most likely what I'm going to try to fight for because it's a pretty consent. The consensus on SACAP is there's not like a need for the bookstore as much, a drop off location or like a pickup location. Maybe um, that's one thing we're considering. But um, one thing we'd like to see that space used for is student space because there's a lack of student space in the Tivoli. And um, if that's something, um, and then maybe you could advocate for on your side. We are definitely going to push for it hard um, on our side because um, this um, there's been a big the big issue of the one of the big issues of the year is um, there's not a lot of student space in the um, Tivoli. Yeah, and that'd be a great replacement for what was taken from students um, this year with the move to Sig move of City South. It's a great point, and um, I would say that the student affairs uh, shop here is advocating on students' behalf 
in that same way. I mean, it's, it's a long, there's a long history between with AHEC and the constituent institutions, us, CU Denver, right, working out stuff together. And there's a lot of conversation around this. There's going to be a big redo of the Tivoli coming up, not right away, but in the next few years, they have it sort of, they've got their money to do it. So that's going to be a huge opportunity for, you know, reimagining how that, how AHEC is used and whether, and how to make it a really good student space, which, you know, we understand it's sort of not right now. It could be much better. There's other, other empty spaces in there, right, that, that also potentially could be used for students like the, I think there's a former credit union space. Abby probably knows a little bit about this, maybe not, and you're more on the housing side of things, right? But um, yeah, so that's a great question. And, and I don't think we're going to, I mean, this is a time to advocate for the use of that space. I do, th so what AHEC needs to do, they don't have any revenue, say, from uh, tuition or other things like that. All their re all their revenue depends on basically parking and auxiliaries, right? Auxiliaries include the food court, the rent we pay to use their spaces, et cetera, et cetera. So they're all, and they have they have debt they need to pay, and they try to operate their business. So they're always looking for ways to generate revenue, which isn't necessarily consistent with student space per se versus selling things out of like a CVS or a Walgreens. Plus, you know, there is a need. I would say for students and faculty everyone else on campus to get things that they need so that's the balance i think they're going to try to strike but just so you know um we have been advocating for for student space i, pre I appreciate that yeah um yeah there is going to be a reimagining the typically um once they get funding from states um yes there there will be a if i'm still here there will be i will be there to advocate for that space yeah. um but um and then otherwise um i yeah uh, my other questions pertain to like um uh, just the supporting of prior to drop application, the particular rate thing you mentioned, um, I didn't like very much. I'm like, is I mean, I don't know if there's many books. I feel like it's just a way to get money, get other lost revenue, revenue a bit. So, um, i in my opinion, I'd advocate for um, doing away with bookstore. Well, it'd be interesting to see what we what responses we get on the survey. And just so you all know, the way these things work, I mean, we have a lot of people on campus with a lot of different opinions, and ultimately, the president has to make the call. What do we do here for us? What's the best thing? And not everyone's going to agree 100 percent, but with wh whichever way we go. But we're trying to get a sense of sort of how students, what students do right now and try to you know, make our decision as, as consistent as possible. With sort of student behavior right now, recognizing sort of all the issues that students are facing and certainly not trying to add any additional costs. Yeah. All right, next is James. Hi, David. Thanks for uh, being here. I'm kind of in agreement with Rita. that um, it's a little hard having a bookstore nowadays because and I think the biggest thing for me when it comes to purchasing books on campus is at the beginning of every semester, I'll usually use the bookstore system to check what books I need. But the moment I see the prices, I go to Amazon because typically the mm -hmm. books there are much cheaper. So I don't know if AHEC slash Barnes & Noble has considered maybe doing like a price matching system because it would be more convenient for me to go to the Tivoli and get my books. Because sometimes those books that you do get on Amazon are delayed because everyone's buying the same book and you might be waiting two days, you might be waiting a month. Whereas I could go to the, the Tivoli and get it, but it's like maybe $50 to $100 more expensive. Um, so I don't know if they've considered doing like a price matching system if they really want to try to keep this contract and keep the system going because that's usually how I see it when I used to work at Target. Price matching is what helped us at Target keep customers from going to other stores. So I mean, if if Tivoli or if Barnes and Noble wants to keep this contract, that's maybe a suggestion we can give to them. But if not, then I agree that the space should definitely be for like student orgs, uh, considering we've been having the whole uh, Ziggy's Hub issue the whole year. Yeah, I think that's a great point around. Price matching, I have to assume, but I don't know that Barnes & Noble has thought about this. Maybe they can't pull it off um, because they're clearly not not doing that, right, based on what I hear in terms of the pricing that they do. And I think even with the pricing that they do, which seems, you know, at quite a high markup, they're, they're, not, they're not making it. But that's a great business point. I have to assume, you know, obviously Barnes & Noble is not the sort of great business that Target is, right? They haven't uh, succeeded the way Target has, so maybe they haven't figured out how to do it. So it's a good point. Wonderful. On to Taylor, then Naomi. Um, so I want to, when I think about the bookstore um, leaving, I think about the functions that will be missed. And I know that one thing that college bookstores are really known for is like their gift shop. 
that gets a lot of students. Um, like when they tour, they want to get their sweatshirt. They want to want to get some, I don't know, like school supplies. Um, just they want to rep their new school. So I think if the bookstore is going away, they, MSU needs a gift shop somewhere for prospective yeah. students and current students. I know a lot of MSU students have a hard time getting affordable, nice quality um, school spirit swag. Yeah, you're, you, that's another great point. Just to be clear, what's going to happen is the bookstore is going to go away. There still will be, we call it merch for short, right? There will be a some kind of way that we have to make sure exists and it's better because we don't think the bookstore merchandise offerings have been very good. Uh, and there's other, and even the way we direct people on our website to online merchandise has not been very good. So we need to really up our game there. So it likely will be a completely separate operation from whatever we books or method we go to either you know sort of pop up merchandise places better online merchandising etc so that's a something we're definitely focused on which is kind of a related but but separate issue from the bookstore but great point the other thing that i think the bookstore has right now it has snacks it has if you need some kind of basic things right you can pick those up and so we think that there needs to be something like that that's also offered we've talked to we are going to be talking to tattered cover by the way I don't think it's going to work out from, you know, maybe they could step in and, and run it. I personally would be surprised if they would want to do it or could do it, but there's a little bit of a chance that something like that could happen as well. Thank you. On to Naomi. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, I really appreciate all this information. I'm glad that you guys are being an advocate for student space because we really do need that here on campus. Um, it's definitely been a year's worth of, um, you know, problems that we've run into. But and I know that, uh, Mike, you said that, um, you know, you will be an advocate, but I wanted to ask from your perspective, how can we encourage students to be that advocate? And then how can TSAC facilitate that as well? So more of like a how rather than that we are. Yeah. So, I mean, so you all have a representative on SACAP, correct? Two. Yeah. So that's one way. Here's the thing about AHEC. They don't have students, right? They're not a school. And they don't work with students regularly, so they don't, that's not their first thought all the time. You know, how will this benefit students? Whereas I would say it's usually our first thought. We feel it's our first priority. So I would, one way to do it is through your representation on SACAB. Another way to do it is, is through your connections with um, the, you know, your advisors for TSAC and then um, up through the, the student affairs um office and um certainly i would argue potentially through things like social media through things like the Met metropolitan right where some you guys can collectively write an article about this and say we understand this is going on we you know we were asking you you know school to prioritize students first there's a dire need for student space and and as part of this bookstore move we're you know we really encourage you to encouraging you to put that, you know, sort of foremost on your screen. And and, um, and I don't really know. I mean, I would say there are people in student affairs who know the space issues way better than, than I do in the Tivoli. I would say AHEC does. And so I meet with them regularly. The people were called points of contact. I, I meet with the AHEC and CU Denver people. So I will certainly uh, raise this point um, in our meetings. Um, and, and so I think it's it's keeping that issue alive out there. However you do it is the best way. And what, you know, sometimes in our senior leader meeting, I report on the bookstore and I, I'm certainly, and I don't, I think everyone would be sympathetic to your concerns around student space and the best use of student space. And I think hopefully going forward, it may not benefit you guys, depending on whether you're here or not. I may not be here, who knows, but you know, it's going to slow process transforming the Tivoli into, into a better space that hopefully through that process, you guys will have your needs solved. But I think there is space there, right? things to be done the question is you know how do we do it how do we do it in a good way and this is where your your voices your participation make good sense thank you i know we're at time but i'm going to read um the comments from our lovely re on this issue um we have seems reasonable that empty space could be capitalized on by student affairs and their campus engagement efforts I feel corporate sponsorship, particularly those working with our department majors hiring graduates, they have a vested interest in the name recognition and investment on campus. Expansion and redevelopment doesn't always 
have to resort to a fee hikes. Agree, Taylor. Amen to that about quality. I bought a sweatshirt recently online and then was given a refund because I was told it was out of stock. Tatter cover is amazing. With a redesigned space, they'd attract people to campus. Yeah. So lots of opportunities here. Um, we think there can there can definitely be improvements, but it's not going to be, I, I don't think, a perfect solution to, to get to all these things. There's also a lot of discussion around the C2 hub. I don't know how many of you see, see that as a potential, quote unquote, student space. Um, and there are some potential development projects that are sort of being cons considered right now. There may be some other event space, which there may be a student space, but I hear what you're saying, sort of more, uh, I, I think like for my college days, sort of student union kind of space where students can kind of come together and hang out, right? Which I think uh, to me is, is if you do it right, can be fantastic. I'm not sure the C2 will quite be that, but I think, you know, the Tivoli space could be that, right? Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll we'll take all these comments. I'll take all these comments um, and I encourage students once the survey comes out to fill out the survey because that more information we have the better. That'd be great. All right, thank you so much for joining thank you, everybody. us today. Um, we care. will now Excuse thank me. you. Um, we will now move on to the rest of our business. We have all these resolutions, but none of their authors are here today, so it will all have to be pushed to next week. Okay, and um, sorry, James has a his hand up. James, go ahead. Uh, never mind. I was going to motion to strike them all, but you had already clear them, so we're good. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, James. Um, since we have no other further business, this concludes our meeting. Is anyone opposed to that? Awesome. No. So moved. Um, thank you all for this amazing um, meeting. Even though we did not meet quorum, we had a wonderful time. I will not see you all next week, but I hope you have a great meeting next week. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Bye. Thanks, Mike.